Welcome to the Pearson Center Conference on the new challenges for the Canada we want. And today we have a conversation with the Honorable Margaret McCain. My name is Andrew Cardoso and I'm president of the Pearson Center. I want to start by recognizing that the Pearson Center is headquartered on the traditional lands of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. And we welcome our speakers and audience who are joining us from across Turtle Island. As you may know, the Pearson Center is a leading progressive think tank that addresses the economic, social, and international challenges of the day. We are proud to say that we are perhaps the only think tank uh, in Canada that, that uh, invites regularly representatives from all five political parties, along with business, labor, and civil society leaders, uh, and many other experts. As we like to say, we bring people and ideas together. A special thank you to all our donors and sponsors, especially our sustaining sponsors, and a special thank you to the sponsors for this conference who include Bayless Medical Technologies, The Hill Times, and the Canadian Health Coalition. Just briefly on the format, we will have a moderated discussion followed by a short Q&A segment. So please send in your questions using the question box on your screen. We will end promptly at 12.45 p.m. Eastern time. So our webinar today is a conversation with the Honorable Margaret Nori McCain, talking about her life's work and her dedication to early childhood education. I will keep my introduction brief because much of the discussion will cover her life's work. The Honorable Margaret McCain is a champion of Canada's youngest citizens. Together with her late husband, Wallace, and their four children, she founded the Margaret and Wallace McCain Family Foundation that promotes early childhood education opportunities for all Canada's children. She is a Canadian philanthropist who's been the first woman to serve as Lieutenant Governor of the province of New Brunswick. Through her career, Mr. McCain has been active in organizations that promote education, music, and the arts at the provincial and national levels. Um, a couple of points I will point out in, in, in the story of early childhood education. In 1998, Mrs. McCain was appointed by the Secretariat of, for Children in the province of Ontario as co-chair of the Early Years Study. And in 2002, she co-chaired a commission on early learning and child development for the city of Toronto. Those are pivotal reports. I wanna take a moment to thank her publicly for her interest in the work of the Pearson Center since its inception in 2013 and, it, and her encouragement for our work in early childhood education that we've done at the Pearson Center. I'm also delighted to tell you that our moderator today is Indira Naidu Harris, Associate Vice President for Human Rights and Diversity at the University of Guelph. She is a former Ontario MPP, Minister and National Broadcaster. She's a leading authority in women's issues, education, childcare and immigration, and is an advisory board member of the Pearson Center and a co-chair of this conference. And with that, over to you, Indira Naidu Harris. Thank you, Andrew, for that lovely introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. I can't tell you how pleased I am to be here with you all today for our annual spring conference to talk about the new challenges for the Canada we want. And who better to talk about the Canada we want than the Honorable Margaret McCain. Margaret McCain was, after all, the first woman to be appointed Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick. But she didn't stop there. Instead, she has devoted her life to working tirelessly to improve the lives of Canadians. Today, she is nationally recognized as being a strong advocate for women's rights, children, social equality, early childhood education, and families. Simply put, the Honorable Margaret McCain is a trailblazer and an inspiration to us all. Her hard work, her passion and her dedication will have an impact on the lives of Canadians for years to come. Margaret McCain joins us now for a special conversation about her life and her passions. Welcome, Margaret McCain. Thank you, Indira. And I, your introduction gave me goosebumps. <laughs> well, and, and I and felt me, a little teary. <laughs> me too, honestly, because your accomplishments have been amazing and groundbreaking all in one life and and uh all of us are in awe of what you've been able to accomplish during your your life really um uh, honorable margaret mccain you've been called and, and let's get into it. you've been called a champion of strong families 
of, of children. And so uh, I want to start there with you, um, with your family and your childhood. You know, people don't get a chance to hear about these things. And I think that it's important to talk to you about that. So take me back, if you will, to those early years growing up in northern Quebec. What was it like? And what are some of your earliest memories? And how do you think they shaped you? Well, thank you, uh, Indira. Uh, and yes, my early years, which are important years, uh, were in northern Quebec, where my father was a mining engineer, prospecting and exploring. And he actually opened up the pretty much the, the northern region of Quebec gold mining and is in the uh, uh, Canadian Mining Hall of Fame, as I, uh, you know, uh, you can see that at Rome. My mother was a biology teacher. He was a widower with four children and she taught some of his children in university. And that's how she met him. And somehow or other was invited to uh, come and visit in a uh, black fly infest infested mining camp. <laughs> Uh, uh, not only from black fly, uh, black flies, but also lusting men. And I don't, I can't imagine a 28 year woman, 28 year old woman in 1933 taking that trek, but she did. And they fell in love and they, she married a man with four teenage children. And then they had four more. So uh, we then he moved to uh, Amos, which is a, was a commercial center to support the mining industry. That's where my early education took place in a small English school. Most of the time I spoke French. Mm -hmm. All my friends were French. Uh, I spoke the language of the street in Northern Quebec. Uh, I took uh, supplementary um, courses in music, piano and French at the convent. But my early years were blissful. I can honestly tell you that I was surrounded by love my parents were very much in love. I don't ever remember a moment of tension between them or a crossword between them, which is quite something. Yes. So they were both extremely loving parents. My father, who uh, uh, maybe my mother educated him, but he was very much a hands-on father as well. In fact, he took my sister and me on business trips to Montreal and Toronto. And uh, in the morning, he gave us each 25 cents to go to the beauty salon to get our pigtails done because he couldn't <laughs> do them. Uh, so he was very much a hands-on father. Then, tragically, he died when I was 11. Uh, he was only 53, died suddenly. In 1945, they, all the gold mines had been put on, on hold during the war, but they were ready to be activated. And he had just trekked 18 miles into one of the mines where the shaft was being sunk that day, died suddenly of a heart attack. So my mother was a widow at 39 with four little children. So then we moved back to Nova Scotia so she could be near her family. Now I have to say that that was, you know, that, that break, uh, he was, our father was much loved. Uh, I feel it even today, the yeah. loss. Uh, but we went back to the farm, the family farm, where we had built a family home on, on his family farm. And uh, her brother closed up his farm in Sackville, New Brunswick, and moved to Truro to be with his sister, his younger sister, moved his mother and two children and his wife. And they lived with us. He became sort of our surrogate father over the next three years. So, I mean, that's the kind of family that we had that she mm -hmm. had, the kind of support system. Uh, so that sort of explains my childhood. So those years, then from then on, I was uh, went to school in Toronto, Nova Scotia, uh, and then eventually found my way to Mount Allison. So that's sort of a, a, an encapsulated version of uh, my early years. Now I have to say that when I think back that my life today has been focused on children, yeah. It's almost like a fulfillment of an early, early, early passion. I'm first with my dolls and then with babies. I couldn't wait to babysit. I couldn't wait to have babies of my own. <laughs> so babies uh, really were a passion for me way back then. 
You know, that's really interesting. And and I, I'm i listening to your talk and you talk about this life filled with love and attention and care. And then um, something dramatic happens, you know, really dramatic when, when your father passes away. And there you are, your mother is uh, with children, uh, you know, facing the challenges in those days, pretty well on her own, but, you know, from the sounds of it, a supportive family. And so, you know, absolutely, she she had that foundation, if you will, to be able to carry on. But I have a feeling that seeing that um, those difficulties and those challenges that she faced at that time really left an imprint on you and left uh, a lasting memories with you about uh, about the struggles that women could face when they're dealing with children. Do you feel that that played a role in you making the decision to you know, study social work at university and commit your life to public service and helping others? It wasn't a direct role, but it was obviously I was influenced. You know, in those days, uh, my mother played the traditional role of wife and mother, but then she was a widow. And that, in those days, gave women permission to take charge and to be independent and to be respected for it. That's the only way women were respected for the take for playing a very independent role. So my mother then became very independent. And I saw, I was actually raised by a single mom, a single mom who was a feminist before I even know that knew the meaning of the word. She was a social activist. She was a strong liberal. She was the first woman to run for public office in Nova Scotia in 1956. She ran against Robert Stanfield, needless to say, you know the outcome. <laughs> he yeah, became yeah. premier, eventually national leader. But nevertheless, she 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 made a stab at, at running for public office, and but never gave up her role in working for women in in politics, and in the Liberal Party, and she was eventually appointed to the Canadian Senate by uh, Pierre Trudeau. I think she was the fifth woman woman. She was the first woman from Nova Scotia to be appointed to the Senate. And she she became a social activist there. She, had, she embraced, espoused all minority rights from, uh, from the, the native people to the French, to uh, farmers, to whoever needed a voice in Ottawa, she was there for them. So she was very much a social activist, certainly, I swear that the day she died, I, she's been pulling my string ever since because everything I do is a fulfillment of her, the path she began. So she obviously influenced me and she, she gave me as a child uh, permission to have a voice. So important at that time, especially for women. So she and her, she herself was a role model, a trailblazer, and and opening doors, and really showing you in many ways that anything is possible if you put your mind to it. I would think, and and if you really work hard. And so tell me about that. You go to university and you start studying and and get into social work. Um, just briefly tell me about what that time in your life was like and how you tried to navigate through uh, to the next steps which were some big steps. Well, today I, I do a lot of talking and speaking, but and when I started university, I was a very, very shy child. So anybody out there who feels shy and can't speak in public, let me tell you, I was that child. I was very young. I had been advanced through school, so I was not quite 16 when I started university. And certainly social work was not on my agenda, nor was history. In fact, I was looking at a music degree that had more appealed to me but the only thing because of my shyness the thought of having to give a recital yeah. was the stumbling block so I steered away from it until uh, I was encouraged to by a, the head of the history department to pursue history but then in third year we I, I fell in love with psychology okay clinical psychology and that sparked my interest in social work Okay. So it was a funny path to get there. Uh, all along, though, I did a lot. I, I studied history, but I also did a lot of music. I studied piano. I studied pipe organ. And my earliest volunteer activities in 
when I got married and lived in Florence, New Brunswick, were all in music. It was all around. Uh, uh, I was the the, uh, uh, the the music teacher was spread very thin, so mm-hmm. I became his volunteer assistant. I accompanied all his church, school choirs and all the soloists, instrumentalists, and vocalists, etc. And okay. so that was my life. I, I was a church organist for forty years. Music was a big part of your life, but I have to ask you then. So you were afraid to participate in a recital, and yet in 1994 you were appointed Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick. I mean, a historic appointment, the first time a woman had been appointed. And as Lieutenant Governor, I mean, you didn't waste time advocating for others. So there you were, you know, not sure if you wanted to play the piano or perform musically. And in the end, you're out there behind podiums and speaking and, um, you know, focusing your attention on all kinds of things, including uh, fa- family violence and so on. Tell me about uh, that. But by that time, I had more or less overcome the shyness. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> that happened when they asked me to be chancellor at Mount Allison University and I had to make a speech. And that was a major feat for me. Huge. You have no idea. But I wanted to, I wanted to take the role. And I thought, okay, I'm going to figure this out. So from the the challenge of making one speech, I ended up as Lieutenant Governor making maybe six speeches a day. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) But but it was before I became Lieutenant Governor that I had already, I guess it was, you see, I'd I'd gone through faculty of social work with the University of Toronto. And Mm -hmm. again, focused on child protection, child welfare. I did my practicum at the Metro Toronto Children's Aid Society. So that was my first love. Mm. And uh, then, but there were no roles, job. I got, I married my husband as and we, I was young, not quite 21 and moved to Florenceville, New Brunswick. There were no jobs for social workers at all, at all, at all. Mm-hmm. So I became very involved in, in, deve- in community activities and community development. There was nothing there in this village of 700 people. So it was community development where I focused my energy. Uh, But it just happened that one day I heard about a group of people who had come together in Fredericton to see what they could do about family violence. Yeah. It was an outgrowth of the first women's shelter in New Brunswick in 1981. So this is about 1984. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to do something more than just provide crisis centers. Yeah. And because of my interest in social work, I, I, I had actually expressed an interest in being a volunteer in a woman's shelter, but there wasn't one near me. So then they said, well, join this group and we'll see what we can do. Eventually that ended up uh, the establishment of a family violence research center at UNB. And the mission was the elimination of family violence through public education and research. A groundbreaking, that, a, a groundbreaking idea, if you don't mind yes, saying, because right. you shifted the attention from the crisis issues management to how do we, you know, stop the problem from even happening uh, yes. through education. And it's a story of how we got there. It's an interesting story, but I mean, I'm not going to take up the time to give you all the details, but we began to realize we didn't know anything about family violence and we had to learn about it. We had to build the knowledge base. So mm-hmm. we established the, the research center. It was the first one in Canada. And uh, we had multiple research projects. And so I then became a spokesperson for, well, in, in the campaign, we, had, we actually endowed this research center. We endowed it right off the bat. And so I became a, a spokesperson speaking out on family violence. And um, I swear that that's what catapulted me into the role of Lieutenant Governor. Because when the press became our allies. Right. They were very much on side and they reported everything I said in public and they reported it accurately. They were, they were just our partners in uh, getting the message out that, that, Family violence is wrong. Beating up on women is wrong. <laughs> yeah. uh, but then we found out how far it reaches into all aspects of life. 
So I became a spokesperson. And then when I became Lieutenant Governor, it was suggested by Ottawa that I might embrace, espouse a cause. And I said, well, I know what it will be. It mm -hmm. will be family violence because it's non-political. And I will give my, my salary to the research center, which I did. But wow. then I became, my voice then became louder. I had a higher platform. Yeah. Uh, and that's what got me, it brought me into the world of Fraser Mustard. And, and you know, I have to say, Margaret McCain, because at that time, people weren't really talking about domestic violence. It wasn't no. something that people were comfortable talking about. That's so there you oh, were. Right. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> you were in that role and you said, you know, here I am and I'm going to be talking about it. And suddenly you opened those doors for those you know, really important conversations that need to ha happen because we can't solve challenges without actually talking about them as I, I know you know. Um, so now tell me about the next step. So you-, well, I, you I must tell you one of the things I did yeah. as a governor, I had the opportunity to promote family violence and I used to have, have what I call salons. Mm -hmm. I would invite several cabinet ministers deputy ministers and researchers to my home for a beautiful dinner with <laughs> wine and good food and maybe a little music after dinner but I positioned them a researcher and a and a, a politician so it was the that was my way of educating the public and you know we did a really good job on that oh love it love that story and so important and and I bet you we're able to accomplish so much more by doing that simple thing, having those dinners and giving people the opportunity to talk to folks that they wouldn't necessarily yeah. bump into every day. And then really changing the agenda, not just in terms of what you were doing in New Brunswick, but the national agenda for sure. Yeah. So from domestic violence and your work there, you have uh, started focusing your efforts on early childhood. So how did you, you talked about uh, Fraser and Mustard, you know, was that, was that kind of the catalyst for that move in that direction or, or were you headed in the direction of early childhood education before that? No, I wasn't. I wasn't. But uh, uh, the president of the university was also a member of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. And the president was Fraser Mustard. He happened to be in New Brunswick. Uh, he was doing a cross country tour on social determinants of health. And he was speaking mm -hmm. to ministries and ministers of, of, of health about these social determinants. So Dr. Armstrong connected the, I had, they, they didn't inform me. I didn't know why I was invited, but they invited me for lunch because they knew the connection between family violence and social determinants of health. So I was invited for lunch and I listened to these three men never explaining themselves. Dr. Mustard spoke in the stratospheres. His, his language was yeah. way up there. I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> Nothing. I didn't even know enough to ask a, 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 a question. I just sat there thinking, I have no idea what they're talking about. They kept talking. He kept talking about gradients of health. And I thought, the only gradient I know is how steep is that ski hill I'm going to go down? <laughs> so, but then Dr. Mustard, uh, he always left people with stacks of research material to read. So I went home with my homework and I read it all because I hate feeling stupid. Yeah. I was feeling stupid. So I read it all and all of a sudden, light bulb went on. Family violence is one of the key impediments to healthy human development. Yeah. And our goal, our mission really was the elimination of family violence through public education and research. So I knew, and then Dr. Muster was saying, if we're going to do anything about it, it has to happen in early years. Mm -hmm. Then it just happened that I moved to Toronto. My family moved, eventually I came to, and when um, Premier Mike Harris asked Fraser Mustard to, to uh, chair this, this uh, study group, uh, on early childhood, mm -hmm. he asked me to be the co-chair. So I, that year, was educated by Fraser Mustard. And I say, I have a PhD from the College of Fraser Mustard on early childhood. 
<laughs> Fantastic. And, and you know, you, you really point out in many ways that um, Fraser Mustard gave you your mission to some extent in your life. He did. You know? He did. Yeah. I actually say this. You know, he died in 2011. And my husband died in 2011, only a few months apart. My husband gave me love, family, and a life. Fraser mm -hmm. gave me a mission. But my husband gave me the wherewithal and the resources to be able to fulfill a mission. So these two important men in my life who died the same year came together uh, and, and our foundation embraced that as our sole mission. When you say your foundation embraced it, I mean, really, Margaret McCain, you know, we're talking about you. You know, a lot of times um, individuals are out there and they wind up facing something new. As you said, you didn't know anything about the conversation at the table was something that you couldn't relate to at that moment. But one thing I think that distinguishes you from many other people is instead of being scared by that uh, occurrence, you know, and, and thinking, oh, you know, running for the hills. Instead, you grab the, the reading material he gave you, you tackled it, you became an expert in it, and you two went on to, you know, do these groundbreaking studies, this groundbreaking study, and really that, that moment in time and that luncheon, so to speak, informed your next steps, which was uh, tackling this this topic with your foundation and giving it the resources, the resources to really keep that uh, the 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 idea of early learning and childcare in the public conversation for years and years and years. And you didn't give up. I mean, you know, I come from a bit of an early child uh, education background uh, as a, as a public servant. So the work that you did laid that foundation for all of us and actually laid the foundation, no question, for today's work, right, with the Canada-wide uh, Early Learning and Child Care Plan. It took a long time coming. Um, amazing. How did you feel when you started to see these pieces in your life coming together in such a big way? Uh, I get a little teary. Yeah. And I, people have asked me, why do you, because the, 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 it seemed for so many years to be an endless mission we were on. I could never, I could not see the end. Just take little tiny steps along the way. Why do you stick to it? I have no idea. I can't give you an answer because I don't know, except that I couldn't give up. There was just, maybe it's in, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe it's in my DNA. Uh, <laughs> Well, you're, you're a fighter, right? For, for those folks who don't have a voice. And I, I think that that comes through in everything that you've done is that- So um, I swear my, my mother had died and uh, she's been pulling my string ever since. And that may be one of the reasons I wasn't, I didn't give up <laughs> because <laughs> I, can, I continued on the path that she had followed <clears throat> in uh, <clears throat> social activism, but I, I knew, I knew I never could give up. It's, and it's still there. And, and here we are today. Tell me, mm. why do you think it took so long? I mean, it's an important conversation. And as you, um, you know, as you've said, it was a conversation that's not happening. There's certainly, you know, all kinds of reasons why women will, and, and, and men will want to stay at home and look after their children during some of those early years. But let's face it, we know that that's a luxury that not everybody has in today's world. It's such an important support for families and for children to be able to have this resource if they need it. And so, um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? It's finally- Why, did it, why did it take so long? First yeah. of all, there's a very, very strongly embedded belief still there that in those earliest years, hey, women should be home looking after the babies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but certainly government should not be there. Yeah. And I think they were more content with, as women went back to work, they were more content with the children going into childcare centers than they were in actually thinking about government intervention yeah. uh, in, in, this, in this space. So there's a very strong cultural belief, A, that government has no place in the earliest years under six, and that mm, 
really, when all is said and done, women should really be home looking after those children. And it was expressed even by one premier at one time to me that that might be the best solution. Mm -hmm. One reason. The other one was expense, money. Yeah. And the third one, I would say they just simply did not understand the future social and economic benefits that Canada, and maybe that maybe this is just something that the stars aligned and it yeah. all came together. The pandemic helped uh, as a catalyst, but everything sort of all of a sudden came together, even though we've been working on it for uh, 17 years and we've poured a lot of money in it. But it's only been as... Uh, the Honorable Ahmed Hussein said, um, two years ago, it was not on the federal agenda at all. No. In fact, it didn't, didn't come onto the federal agenda until two years this coming July. Before that, yeah. they weren't thinking about it. No, nope, It just it was wasn't there. They, they could understand childcare spaces, but they did not understand the as strong. But this, is a, this is a whole of society story. This has, this impacts the social economic prosperity of our people for the future. In fact, this, this is what I call preparing our people for the future. Absolutely, and that's what it's all about because there are so many challenges that people faced uh, during the pandemic as you talked about that, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not just that, but building for the future. We have to be able to come out of this in a strong way and especially Canadians. And, yeah. and I think that this and is until, going to give, give us the foundation to be and, successful. And, and until we find a system that will include every child, every yeah. child that is born in Canada has to have access to this system. That's why we are building a system, not a program. Yeah. We're not, we're not, we're not supporting small businesses. We are building a system to provide equal opportunity to every child for early learning, but it also includes care. But the learning yeah. piece, the learning piece is probably the most important. Huge. It's huge. That's yeah. the one that's going to affect the future economic and social prosperity of Canada and Canadians. That's the piece. That's, it's a whole of society story. So really there were two parts to the story when it finally started to come together. Mm -hmm. Short-term needs, some immediate short-term needs for increased spaces, childcare spaces. But it was the long-term plan that was hard to understand, yeah. hard to sell, hard to get government to realize, you know what, we have to put the big money behind it. But we did. And what else did we get? We got two or three ministers that actually believed in it. Yeah, yeah. So important. As you said, everything lined up uh, finally after all these years. So, you know, the provinces have signed this deal. There are promises of cutting childcare costs in half, you know, eventually going to $10 a day. It's amazing. You know what? And Dara, yeah. I'm, I have to, I, I'm interrupting and it's, and it's not a nice thing to do. No, but it's okay. <laughs> I believe, I believe within five years, the $10 will be gone. It's going to be free, just like all public education is free. It has Fingers to be. Fingers crossed. That would be fantastic. Yeah. And, and, and so you're bringing me to, you know, we're at the beginning of this journey. It's going to be a long journey. Everybody recognizes that. And maybe that was part of the reason why it took a while is, you know, we go through these cycles of campaigns and so on, you know, and people want to see results and, you know, something that's going to happen five, six, eight years down the road, you know, they, it's a, it doesn't necessarily... Uh, come to people's minds just how important it is to make those commitments now so we can actually get to the end of that journey. So my next question is just, you know, what do you think needs to happen next to make this uh, plan successful? You know, there's a lot of building to do, you know, we're talking about spaces, ECEs. What do you think we should really be paying attention to to make it successful? It has to win the legislation. That has to pass. That's a work in progress. It's being worked. They're working on it right now. So that's the next big, big, big piece so that no government can ever take it away. I don't think even without le legislation, any government would ever take it away from now on. It doesn't matter who they are because people want it and need it. And they're beginning to recognize it. We've, that's a monumental change. But the legislation is the next big piece. The other piece, which uh, uh, Jane Berger and Carrie McQuaig are very involved in, 
mm-hmm. are, is the implementation at the provincial level because that's not federal. Yeah. That's provincial. Each province has a right to do it in their own way and make their own mistakes. But we are very much on uh, tap as consultants to help them because these two women understand all the uh, obstacles, all the glitches, all the challenges that are avail- that are there for them. So their phones never stop ringing. Mm-hmm. They're acting as consultants because, as I said, it's this is a provincial uh, jurisdiction, yeah. and the federal government cannot get involved in the actual implementation. They can be watchdogs, and they can they can legislate the big pieces, but the actual implementation has to take place on the ground. And that's where we still have a little bit of a role over the next five years. And that's what to watch for, to make sure. What we really need to focus on though is getting it into the public system. Mm -hmm. Now there's an outcry, a bit of an outcry from for-profit centers. Yeah. Uh, But remember for-profit centers are small business. They march to shareholder demands. Yeah. There's a place for them in this in the in the landscape if they want to want to be there. But they have to see themselves as independent schools, uh, uh, independent childcare centers as independent schools are today in our system, without federal tax dollars, without any tax dollars. And you're pointing have- out to just how complex this this landscape is right Right. um you know private public and then people who don't think there should be any private and yet we're sometimes talking about areas where they're the only game in town you know and we have to build on things yeah but these these for profits you know there is a space for them there's a space for private schools but they have to do something different they cannot rely on tax dollars they have to improve their product and charge accordingly they have to play the business rules. The, the not-for-profits will want to migrate into the public system. Why? Because they get paid better, they're respected more, they have better benefits, it's better for the workers, it's better for the children, and it's better for the families. Mm-hmm. So the not-for-profits will eventually migrate into the system, into the public system. And remember, we are building a system Mm-hmm. For profits are in our small businesses and they want to figure out how to survive. Well, there's a way. There's a way just in like independent schools do. Yeah. And you know, there's still a, a, a space out there. Some people feel if you pay for something, you get it's better. And there'll be some that still want to go to the private child care centers because they think because I'm paying a lot for it, I get better. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's better. Some people think that private schools are better. I'm not convinced of that. uh. Last question. You know, it's been just wonderful speaking with you, but, um, you know, we're talking today about how we get the Canada we want. And, And I want to hear your final thoughts just briefly on how do we get the Canada we want uh, on you know through early childhood education and the role it plays, and I also see by the way that Andrew's here, so we'll we'll have to wrap it up soon. But just very quickly, very, you know, what very kind quickly, of a role? Yeah, very quickly, uh, our role I see as early childhood as part of this, preparing our people for the future, and preparing our planet for the future, and the place in which we live, and make it making them both the best that we can be. I'm I, one final comment. I have been told uh, it has been said that this this early learning and care system mm-hmm. is as as important to the future well being of Canadians as universal health care. Yeah, fantastic. You're giving me goosebumps now. So thank you very much for those wise words. It's been a, a pleasure and an honor speaking with you. And I'm now going to turn it over to thank you, Indira. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks. Thank you, Indira, and thank you, Margaret McKinn, so far. Uh, we're almost at time, but but I've got a couple a, a couple of quick questions. Maybe I'll just I'll just boil them down if you if you don't mind. We'll we'll go a little bit over time. Um, a couple. Well, one of the questions was, how did you change the public discourse about the role of women vis-a-vis the working world and childcare? Okay, so the child, the, the childcare system that we have, the plan is focused on the child, but, 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 big three of them. 
it has to be configured around the working life of the mothers and the fathers, of the, of the parents. It has to fit their work life. Uh, they, their, their work schedules, wherever it is, and it'll change from uh, Calicut, New Brunswick, to Ecolo. Uh, it has to fit whatever the, that community need, those community needs are. But the system has to be configured around the work life of the parents. However, the child will always have access to the system, regardless of the parents' work status. If they're not working, the child still has access to the system. Okay. And and the other question was, um, uh, uh, could you could you say a little bit more about the the benefits of early childhood learning? The benefits. The benefits are uh, better literacy, numeracy. As Fraser Mustard used to say, a learning health and behavior. If you do it right in those earliest years, you will improve their emotional intelligence, their, their, social, uh, uh, their sociability, their ability to work with people, their openness to learning in literacy and numeracy all aspects of learning. They're, it will improve their curiosity about learning. It will prepare them for the future, but it will also benefit their physical and mental health. Okay, and, and one last question about, about your life story. The question is, is how did you choose the courses you took in university? I guess the, the degree that you followed. Uh, the best I can say is from the seat of my pants. <laughs> <laughs> I fell into them. I had no intention of doing history, but my the, his, the head of the department sort of inflated my ego and, and made me feel so good about uh, a paper I'd written that oh, he made uh, he felt I felt like take on the world. Then the psychology professor oh impressed me so much. Then I'm off and running into psychology and social work. So, uh, and the reason I didn't do music was because. My shyness got in the way. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, I mean, that, that's a really important point because I, you know, I think a lot of young people stress a lot about what they're going to study, and mm -hmm. I think what you're saying is, you know, do whatever you do, and oh, I agree. Things Look, fall into place over time. Never ask, uh, 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 even when they finish university, but certainly when they start university, what are you going to do or finish high school? Is it's a terrible question to ask a high school student yeah. because they'll probably change their minds as I did five times <laughs> yeah yeah and at the end of it you 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 continue to make such enormous uh, impact on, on what you've chosen to do and i'll tell you my husband who built a, a frozen food empire ask him <laughs> why did he choose french fries the only thing he knew about them was that they tasted good <laughs> that's important and McCain's fries <laughs> taste pretty good, so. Well, they, 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 I have to say those French fries, though, they funded this early, but a lot of our early work in early childhood. Yeah, yeah. Well, before, before we end, I just want to remind our audience that we've got another great webinar this afternoon uh, with Labor Minister Seamus O'Regan, uh, who will be in conversation with Indira Naidu Harris again at four, four o'clock. And tomorrow, at noon, we've got a session on the new growth sectors, which are going to be important to economic recovery. And that's the end of our three week uh, conference. Um, I'll give the last word to Indira, but I just want to say to you again, Margaret, thank you for, uh, for, for joining us today. Uh, but more importantly, for the work you've done all this time. I think this is a very exciting time um, that you've been a major part in bringing us to this point in, in early childhood education and the National Child Care Program. So, Congratulations on that. And uh, um, thank you, Andrew. You're giving me goosebumps again. <laughs> Indira, over to you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. And uh, thank you so much, Margaret McCain. It has been a pleasure speaking with you today and having you be so uh, open about sharing your story and your personal anecdotes. Uh, I've learned a lot, but I just want to say to you that as the former Minister of Early Learning and Childhood uh, in, uh, in Ontario, the work you did was so important to inform the work that we were doing. And now look at uh, where we are, a national plan, and it's all thanks to you. Uh, and so well, I just I, say it means a lot to those of us that worked in the field. Thank you, but remember there was a team. There's a team, not just me. <laughs>
Thank you. And dear, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you.